Cool. Hello, hello, Alana. Welcome to the Shuffle Forager podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How's everything across the pond? Across the pond is uh, pretty good at the moment. We're starting to get some good sunny weather, which is a nice change coming out of the dark winter months, which I'm very grateful for. And I know you were over here not, yep. not that long ago. Did you experience some of the yep. British weather? Or I got I got your uh, delightful Arctic blast that was coming down through Scotland. So yes, it was, um, I, I'm used to it though. It's very similar weather to here in the Northwest. So, you know, pretty, pretty same. But you guys are coming up on your hunting season though, aren't you? I, I believe, I believe so. I mean, I've been, um, I mean, I'm still relatively new to the whole truffle thing anyway. So my connections are still really relatively thin, although they're growing and expanding hello by the by the day which is awesome <laughs> but the the few truffle farmers over here in the uk have been posting i've seen on instagram like big 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 hordes of uh some truffles so i'm guessing yes um also my my truffle hunting friend as well um based in in europe southern europe it's secret location can't disclose it but she's been posting some uh sure. the massive uh um summer truffles which is which is pretty cool so i guess things Great. have been working out well in terms of weather and rain which Good. is exciting and 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 over there and and what you're seeing i know i know the seasons are different but um I've got yeah no so I know you yeah said well we can i mean we can dive in yeah we can dive into a lot of this so we're coming on the end of our wild hunting season here and we've had a, a heat spike the last week or so which um again i can i can dive into like why we do certain things a certain way but um we're basically going out super, super, super early in the morning if we go out and then working the dogs for a very short period of time, and then we're done. So we're coming on the end of our of our wild hunting season. So it it varies. Usually it goes through May sometimes, but uh, we've had unusually hot temperatures this week, and it's just gonna it's gonna annihilate everything. So oh, okay. Wow. Well, yeah, maybe we can jump into a bit more of that um, yeah. on this call as well. I mean, there's there's I almost don't even need to plan what I'm going to ask you because it's like <laughs> you're putting um, somebody who's like, you know, top of their field in a space that I'm like, you know, super interested in. So I'm, most of it would just come out naturally. But um, one of the things yeah. you mentioned just a couple of days ago, and, and I thought it might be a good way to even just kick off is um, this. You, you noted um, something about um, a Michelin star chef asking you to find some wild yeah. ingredient for you uh, way back when. and and possibly that may have yeah. been the beginnings of uh, a change in life trajectory is what I what I gathered from that. Can Some you of it. share a bit more about Some that? Some of it. Yeah, yeah. So let me back up a little bit and say, you know, I've been doing this for a while. So um, I've, it's been almost like 15 years of doing this. So I started being involved in the industry in some capacity since my like early mid twenties. Um, and, um, you know, back in, let's say 2005, I don't know if you know who Paul Stamets is. He's a, like an amateur mycologist. He's based here in the Northwest. He's done a lot of research on, um, and we call him, an uh, amateur? Uh, <laughs> I don't well, know what I, a professional I, mycologist is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, right. No, yeah. I agree. No, I'm with, with you. you. Like, I'm he's with like you. a world renowned, you know, fellow, but not everybody knows him. So yeah. Paul Stamets is here in the Northwest. Um, Back in like 2005, he wrote a book, I, I believe it was 2005, on um, like mycoremediation. So mm. using fungus to pull like toxins out of in the environment, right? Um, long story short, I have a brother who's really involved in that, that kind of stuff, mentioned it to me, filed that away in the back of my head. Um, and then, um, you know, a few years later, I was working in the wine industry in California and my brother mentioned that same brother mentioned to me, Oh, you know, we actually have truffles in the Northwest. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Right. So again, skip a couple of years forward. Um, I moved out of the wine industry. Um, I really liked that idea of like food and science combination, which is why the truffle industry, you know, appealed to me to some degree. Um, although it didn't really exist at that time. Um, but then back here in the Northwest, I, delightfully naively was like oh i'm gonna have a wild foods company like i went into this with the intention of i'm gonna do a lot of foraging i'll create this great business around it um and one of the first things that happened um a little bit out of the blue is i had a very um everyone would know the name but it's a very well respected michelin star chef 
contacted me looking for a very specific wild forage ingredient. Um, and I was like, okay, cool, great. Like I was so flattered. I don't know how they found me, whatever. Um, it was great, had a great conversation with them. I started digging deeper into what they really wanted and they wanted a lot of this product. And this was um, a type of lichen actually that they were looking for. And they weren't even gonna use it in dishes. They were basically just using it as like garnish. Um, they wanted a, a large volume of it. Now these lichen take 25 years or more to grow. And I was like, ah, oh, I just don't feel comfortable mm. harvesting all of that, like with an unknown kind of deadline on, on when you wanna get this. Cause it's not like a super common fungus or lichen around, right? So um, I eventually said no to them, but what it led me to was this idea of sustainability and harvesting. And how can you use products that come out of our forest in a sustainable way? And how can I work with those timber companies and those small landowners to create revenue streams for them um, while also having a sustainable product that's not really going to damage the environment and will highlight kind of the natural bounty we have, but in an ethical way. Um, and so, you know, restaurant industry has evolved a lot since then, I'd like to think. Um, but that kind of opened my eyes to some of the practices and stuff that went on even within this whole like foraging industry. Um, and so that kind of shaped the trajectory of me really just focusing on truffles. Um, and when I started with the truffles, I don't want to say <laughs> there was nobody doing it here in Washington. So I'm, I'm in Washington, not Oregon, <laughs> which a lot of people think Pacific Northwest truffles, they associate it with Oregon. Um, but I'm in Seattle. And um, when I first started doing this, um, there was a small industry in Oregon doing wild hunting um, and not Again, I don't want to say there was nobody in Washington because I'm sure that's not accurate, but it really wasn't talked about. It was, you know, evolving, but very, very, very small. Um, this was at the same time in the U.S. when all of those truffiers and truffle orchards were just starting to put trees in the ground. So I saw this opportunity um, from the dog side to be a service provider for the industry. So again, I have a background in, um, you know, kind of that food science combination with some of that, that work from, um, working the wineries and kind of my passion for that, but I've always been interested in animals and I am a self-taught dog trainer. So I am, um, it's the, the letters after my name are CP, I always have to think about CPDTKA which is a certified professional dog trainer knowledge assessed. So certifications you have to go through in order to do that, but I didn't go to like a school for it. Um, it was a lot of reading, a lot of talking to people, stuff like that. Um, and so taking that in combination with what was going on in the truffle industry at the time, which is there were all these people putting in those truffle orchards, but nobody had dogs. Mm. And so at the time, we thought that when you would plant those trees, oh, five years later, you'll have a lovely crop of truffles, right? That was everybody's attitude at the time. Um, we have since learned, you know, it takes a little bit longer than that to, to ramp up and get to production. Um, but I was like, okay, great, cool. Nobody's really doing this. This is a space I can kind of get in front of and, and start fulfilling and helping um, use my dog training skills to help those farmers also develop some of that. So that's kind of how I landed in it, but yeah. The Michelin star chef thing was, was interesting. I mean, um, we still work with a lot of Michelin star chefs, but um, again, that industry has evolved a little bit, but it kind of shaped and routed my trajectory to a little bit more of being conscious about sustainable, sustainable harvesting of products and what that really means. And we teach that to all of our students too. Like we don't want people over harvesting the truffles in the forest because they're part of the ecosystem. Um, and you know, the animals and everything eat them too. So um, we're big into ethics and sustainability here. Amazing. Thank you for that. That sounds um, yeah. just fascinating. And um, mm -hmm. can you just give a bit of a lay of the land for me? Um, treat me as an absolute beginner to uh, North American truffles and, um, you know, where they are, what species you have type of thing. And um, maybe just touching on the how things have become so popular you know because i mean just like over here things yeah. are booming and uh, you know over there it's probably 10 times more so i would imagine um but yeah that would be really helpful it's yeah it's interesting so i mean there are hundreds of species of truffles okay just like globally and even in the u.s there's hundreds of that there's a subset that we consider culinary right so ones that you actually might want to eat that have those tasty aromas um in the u.s the our industries are still small, 
So I want to put that as like a framework around this. It's not like it is booming in terms of there's a lot more excitement about it. And I see, uh, you know, more and more interest every year. Um, but it's still a really pretty small industry overall for the U.S. So um, the majority of the culinary truffles in the U.S. as of right now and where we understand where they're located are in the Pacific Northwest, which is where I'm located. So Seattle, so um, a little bit in B.C. in Canada, Washington and Oregon. Um, there are a couple of species, and I'll get into the specific species, in um, uh, like the south. There, there's a species called pecan truffles. As the name would suggest, grows with pecan trees. Um, they grow with other things too, but um, that is found mi- anywhere from the Mississippi all the way to the eastern seaboard. Um, it has started to pop up a lot more in some of these truffle orchards people are planting because it's a native species that, you know, I can, that's a whole rabbit hole I can dive down. Anyway, so pecan truffles are one. Um, there's another species called the Appalachian truffle or, um, I like to use the Latin names for them too, so we're clear about what they are. So, so uh, pecan truffle is tuber leonii. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, Appalachian truffle is um, uh, tuber caniculatum, um, and there's that's a it's gotten a lot of press in the last year or two. Um, there are I think I can count on one hand the amount of people who actually hunt for them on the East Coast. So there's a lot of talk about it. It's a really cool species almost nobody hunts for it because they don't really know where to look. So we're hoping to start to change that with more and more trained dogs out there and and going out and doing the legwork and searching because we know they're there. It's just a matter of honing in on it. And so the Appalachian truffle. With the Appalachian one, sorry, I may completely be bluffing this. Or did I see an article somewhere that someone in the States had cultivated it? Or or is is that one? It's actually in Canada. That's Jerome. Yeah, so Jerome um, Quiron. I'm not going to pronounce his last name correctly. (laughs) He is with Arbor Arbor Inov in Canada. So he's in Quebec and okay. he has cultivated them and he's kind of in the process of like doing all of that and, and setting up those plantations. We do have a fellow here in the US who is also kind of partnering with him, trying to cultivate the trees to do that. So there's, again, it, it's growing as an industry, but I would equate it and we'll get to our Pacific Northwest stuff in a second, but I would equate what's going on out there to be like where we were 10 years ago. Okay. So um, people are kind of like learning where to find the stuff out there. The industry is really small out there. Again, there's like three guys who look, hunt for it. Um, and like, that's it. Um, so we're trying to develop that knowledge base and, and kind of open some of those doors for folks out there. So that's the Appalachian. There's another species I'm really excited about, but again, it maybe only exists in some of these more sensitive habitats. Um, so there's a little bit more research that needs to be done on this. Um, it doesn't necessarily have a common name yet, although I think the common name they're trying to put on it is like Blue Ridge Truffle. Its scientific name is, and I'm gonna butcher this one too, is Amaya gigantia. Um, and it is a species they found in um, Tennessee um, and now North Carolina um, and also Japan. So like it's, it, there's a lot of research that probably needs to go into it, but um, that's a really interesting one. There's one of our students out there started finding a bunch of them and has a little business around that, like a wild foraging business that they do. So that's been cool. Um, but again, only a handful of people really know where to look for, for those. So part of this is disseminating some of that information and, and spreading that knowledge. Um, on the West Coast, uh, the primary ones we work with are, there's, there's, there's a handful of types. Um, the primary ones we work with are what we call the, the Oregon winter white truffle which is tuber organensis. And then our, I like to say Pacific Northwest black truffle because it's not just Oregon. So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna say Washington black truffle too. Um, And it is a Lucangium species. So it is Lucangium carthusianum. Um, And our seasonality for these things. So for our Pacific Northwest truffles for the winter white, uh, for the Oregon ones, it, it varies based on where you are on location. So this is how I like to describe it, is if you think about the Pacific Northwest, you've got Oregon, which is like a little square block, Washington on top of it with a little hand. Um, and the, in the middle, there's a valley. It's the Willamette Valley, if you may have heard of it, great wine growing region amongst other things. Um, if you were to take that Willamette Valley and stretch it all the way up to the Canadian border, that's where you find the white truffles are in this kind of narrow, low valley land. Um, the problem with Washington is we have Puget Sound. So the valley like would cut right through the water. So obviously you're not gonna find them there. 
But that's kind of in that middle stretch is where you find the whites. And then the black truffles, which are our Pacific Northwest black truffles in the Cangium, you find on the shoulders of that. So in the foothills of the mountains, both in our Cascade Range and our Olympic Range or Coastal Range, if you're in Oregon. Um, seasonality varies. So uh, like, let's use the white truffles. Our white truffle season, and climate change is affecting this pretty dramatically, at least mm. the data that we've been collecting. So I have data from the past 13-ish years on some of these harvests, and it's been interesting to see the progression. So and hypothetically- sorry, what, what sort of data are you, um you know talking about here yeah so. mostly mostly it is just harvesting data so we're, we're getting date that we're harvesting and yields that we're getting out of these um locations um and and some locations we've been monitoring for you know a really long time so it's been interesting to know when we start finding them um and what that looks like you know the goal is to eventually compile that data and like take a look at weather patterns and stuff like that too mostly right now it's just it's it's in a big spreadsheet that yeah. just needs to be um, picked through. So, um, but yeah, so, you know, it used to be that we would find in, in my area of Seattle, we would find um, the, the white truffles, the winter white truffles from, let's say, what we, Thanksgiving, so mid-November to Valentine's Day. So November 15th to, to February 15th is when we would find the whites. Um, if, as you move down the coast, it gets later. So we find them about two weeks before Southern Washington, which finds it about two weeks before Central Oregon, which finds it about a week before Eugene. So so we would start finding white truffles in November. Down in the Eugene area, they wouldn't start finding them really till mid-December, late December. Um, and they have maybe a little bit shorter seasons in Oregon too, because it's a little bit warmer. We're a little bit colder up here in Washington, which is really what our truffles need. Um, the black truffles, technically, we find every month of the year, um, and we have found them in every month of the year. That being said, the quality really shifts and changes from month to month. Your best quality stuff happens when there's colder temperatures. Um, and so December, usually late December, and then easily through April and then into May. It used to be some years we'd find them all the way through June in great, in great uh, quantity, but the last we're gonna count this year as this too. The last three years, essentially in the Pacific Northwest, we've had really significant heat events in mid-May, like we're having right now and into June. And so that has um, really damaged um, or impacted production. It also impacts production for the future year. So um, we had a big heat event in 2021. Um, in May and June, it just fried all those little baby truffles in the soil that were just starting to grow. So the next season was the worst we've had on record since we've started keeping records. So, um, you know, the heat kind of and the climate change impacts have been shifting when we're harvesting, which is later and later in the year. <laughs> wow. Um, Does that answer your question? It's a yeah. long-winded answer to all the truffle species. It's a fantastic answer. Um, I can't wait to listen back to it. <laughs> um, yeah. What I was going to ask is um, that on sorry we go do you know anything about their aroma aroma profiles because they're very different than the stuff you have out there too yeah go, go for it um wh what's your top three and the differences yeah. in your in your because obviously i know you've been over to europe a lot oh. as well so you've i mean talk yeah. about the differences well and we grow on those troop years here in the U.S., we grow Paragord truffle and we grow summer truffles on some of the orchards here in the U.S. So um, favorite is tough because um, some people will, will get a lot of flack for this. <laughs> I personally really, I really like the Paragord truffles. I think they're really versatile. Um, they have that kind of earthy um, tobacco aroma. And then when they're fresh out of the ground on some of these truffle orchards, we also get aromas of um, peat and like seaweed in a really nice way that, that you don't get when they're imported into the U.S. because those volatiles burn off real quick. Yeah. Um, our native truffles have just very different profiles. So our native white is, um, I'm assuming you haven't had them before. Have you had a chance to try any of them? No, no, no nothing from over there, no. Okay. So um, they're they're much more fragile than the stuff you have in Europe. They just they don't last as long. They're thinner skinned, um, and so they just don't they don't travel well, which is why you don't really see them exported. Mm. Um, they the, our native whites sit somewhere close to um, 
the the Italian white truffle. They're smaller in size. They don't have that kind of um, garlicky punch necessarily. But if you if you've ever had Bianchetto truffle, they sit in like in between those two. So if you've got Italian truffles here and Bianchetto truffles here, they kind of sit right in the middle. Um, they're really good. They're the the most common um, descriptor people use is like diesel gasoline, which sounds gross. Um, but like in a good way, um, yeah. they have that hard to describe truffle odor, but they are incredibly strong. Um, so a little goes a long way with those. And um, are those, are they, are they, native I, black? Sorry, like with the, the Italian white, I guess, um, would you just sh shave these and not cook with them? So you can do both. So um, you could treat the whites. You can treat much like you would an Italian white in classical, like French dishes, Italian dishes, things like that. Um, you can also infuse is one of my favorite things to do with them. Um, you can cook with them a little bit, but again, you will burn off a lot of those volatiles if you apply a lot of heat. So yeah, so adding them, you know, after on hot food tends to be the best use for those. Um, uh, a lot of people do them on um, even soups and stuff like that can be really good. Um, one of our, one of the guys we work with, he makes a, um, a cauliflower soup with, um, native white truffle and it is mind blowingly good. It really kind of highlights those, those, uh, those high notes in the truffle. Um, our native black truffles are very, very different. They have fruity aromas. So, um, people often describe it as green apple, pineapple, like that green apple Jolly Rancher. If you guys have Jolly Ranchers over there. Um, uh strawberries and yogurt kind of aromas they will have birthday cake smells like that yeast kind of smell sometimes um and then they will have chocolatey notes and then blue cheese notes and then they go downhill very quickly after that <laughs> so they kind of have a range of aromas and so, you know so you want them people, in that like floral so, sorry so fruity that people might use them dessert for the desserts oh, yeah no. that's yeah. actually one of the primary i think that's where a lot of people's minds go to is yeah. desserts with them. So we've had some students make some really cool things with them, like um, tray leche cake, or um, we have one student who made, um, she makes um, macrons um, and like those little, you know, French uh, cookies. And um, she infused it somehow into the sugar and butter that she made it with. And you could taste it in it. It was really cool. They were very pretty as well too. Not my skill set. Um, uh, I like to infuse them into chocolate, honestly. So one of the best things for our native black truffles is actually infusing into other foods. Um, it, they're such a delicate truffle that if you cook with them like you would for an Italian white or something like that, like you put it on pasta, you're not going to really get the same kind of aromatics out of it. They do pair incredibly well with seafood, which we obviously have a lot of here in the Pacific Northwest. So smoked salmon um oysters one of our favorite things to do we're lucky enough to have friends who are oyster farmers and so um we did some trials with this where it was just raw oyster piece of black truffle piece of uh, cracked black pepper on top and that was it and that was amazing um and what was even better about that is like the truffle site for that was literally across the street from the oyster farm so it was like you know everything is from within like a hundred foot radius which was really cool um uh, but seafood, they pair well with scallops is a favorite. So, but they're, but they're those more floral kind of, kind of notes. And so you want to use more delicate preparations than you would like a classical Italian or French kind of dish. Amazing. Um, and the uh, one question I was going to ask you as well is, um, I recently interviewed a, uh, um, a UK, uh, amateur mycologist who's just mushroom mad as a lot of them are right but he's also truffle mad as well and um a great podcast because mm -hmm. he, he really opened my eyes to the fact that there's like 90 plus species in the uk um and he yeah. i think he tried to train his dog but gave up um but he had mm -hmm. therefore put all of his energies on just spotting the signs and just just going out and looking mm -hmm. and like you know uh, and so um <laughs> the other thing that he was mentioning on on that um podcast was um because over here we're obviously always looking for chalky limestone soil so that's just mm -hmm. that relatively speaking that's not a huge amount if you look at a geolo geological map in the uk that's like the north downs mm -hmm. south downs and a few others um but he was just saying that even though that is the case there's potentially pockets of um the right type of soil within the wrong type of soil landscape and i was just wondering um 
and this is a question actually that came from my truffle hunting friend Julie actually she was she was wanting to ask you in terms of where truffles are naturally growing in America and are there because mm -hmm. obviously the common places are well known like you've just mentioned the name several times but mm -hmm. are there pockets outside of that do you think that are just undiscovered because people aren't looking or yeah yeah it's a great question so it's different in different parts of the country right because it's different species of truffles and they have different things that they like in their host trees so in the northwest um our soils are very acidic so um they our truffles grow primarily with douglas fir which mm. you actually have a lot when you start getting up into scotland and whatnot too and i'm like are they here <laughs> um so you never know we did have a student actually move to um luxembourg and she had a trained dog and she was just out walking and found some there right mm. so um that particular species does exist in europe it's just not super common um that we know of so so yeah, so um, in the Northwest, we've got pretty acidic soils. It's pretty much all across the board uh, if you're west of the mountain ranges. Mm. Um, there are other species of truffles though. And so, you know, on the East Coast is kind of what I was talking about. Um, they, they're they there, people just don't really know where to look. So as we start to get more trained dogs in these areas and people start putting in the time hiking and doing legwork and just trying to figure it out, we start to learn more and more and more. When I first started doing this here in the Northwest, again, I was saying like there wasn't really anybody here doing it. And it just took a lot of walking around. I, I got comments from a lot of scientists at the time saying, you're not gonna find them in Washington. And I was like, well, we technically have somewhat similar habitats to Oregon, so why not, right? Like the soil texture is a little different, but it's the same pH, it's the same trees. Why wouldn't they be here? Um, and it took me literally going and like checking all those places in order to start to really find that stuff and build that knowledge base. So I think to some degree, once you start to have more trained dogs and, and a concentration of people dedicated to kind of exploring and looking and seeking this stuff out, we start to learn more and more about it. Um, but the the types of soils and stuff you'll look in will be very, very different. So like East Coast, you are looking for stuff that's a little more limestone-y kind of habitats, right? And, and a lot of those grow with oak trees. There's other host species too. Um, people find them in Florida in what I would think are like very swampy conditions, right? And so it's really broad. And I think one of the things that we try to teach a lot of our students, especially who are not here in the Northwest, but are all across the world or particularly on the East Coast, is we try to teach them um, what we call an array of odor. So it's like, we'll start you on one type of truffle, but then we'll have you learn a bunch of other ones because you don't know what we're, you're going to come across out there. So um trying to set you up for as much success as possible if you come across something cool that, and that definitely makes me want to ask a question just to piggyback on mm -hmm. that but then before we go down sure. the rabbit hole of asking you dog training questions but so yeah obviously i've learned that you know there's training dogs on truffle oil versus real truffle you've obviously just alluded there to having different aroma truffle oil based on the species um what's your thoughts on this and and what would you, I mean, you, I guess you obviously teach your students to train on specific odor if you're using truffle oil, but is, is it, how necessary is it, or is it sort of necessary <clears throat> when you want to get to that next level? Um, yeah, so we work with a variety of dogs, right? And so, um, how do I say this? So, um, just went blank. Um, so we do use, we do use, use truffle oils of a specific odor set. So I always say you want to train, if you can, you yeah. want to train your dog on what you would like them to find. Some dogs are hyper specific where let's say you got one fresh truffle and you trained them on that. And then you bought a new one and brought in they'd be like, what is this? Like, this is not the same. Like I've seen that happen with some dogs who are hyper literal. Um, a lot of dogs can and do generalize a little more. That being said, we want to create the best case scenario for success. So like I said, we train on array of odors. So oftentimes we start our students on um, a single odor or actually with our Northwest stuff, we actually blend our, our, um, our white and our black together um, and start the students on that. And then eventually we separate it out. Um, so the dog has to learn that sometimes it's not just the black and the white odor together that counts. It's when you find them individually. 
on top of that, we do like to use real truffles when we can and not just like a single truffle. So like with a student, let's say you were a student here in the Northwest, I would give you a bunch of different pieces of individual black truffles to work with. The reason being is each individual truffle, while they are the same species and there's like 500 different volatiles they could be, they're going to each have a different expression of that. So this one may have, you know, VOC one through 10, and this may have, you know, nine through 15 or whatever. So we want to make sure that the dogs uh, work on that array of odor and that they have a really broad spectrum for what is acceptable. Um, does that make sense? And so, you know, mm -hmm. usually we'll start dogs on one kind. And then once we teach them the patterns and behaviors of how to search and what they're looking for, adding in new odors is really pretty easy. Again, some dogs do generalize really, really well, but, but taking your dog who may be trained on one thing and plopping them down in a different environment and just expecting them to find Paragord truffles when you've never trained on it, that to me is not the best way to, to be successful. If you actually teach them how to do it, then um, you have a higher chance for success than just kind of, you know, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. There, um, there was a study that was just done. There's some interesting um, results from it. It was out of, um, we participated in it. It was out of, um, I want to say Germany. Some of the scientists were trying to ascertain what it is in the various different types of truffles that the dogs are actually alerting on, like which gaseous compounds, right? I think their data was a little inconclusive, um, but obviously some of the, the sulfur um, uh, terpenes is not the right word, but some of the volatiles that are associated with sulfur are common across many truffles. And so the dogs will alert on those. Um, but again, some dogs are hyper-specific. And so we work with a lot of different types of dogs and we have to come up with a training plan to help you know everybody, not just the ones who are good at generalizing. So that's why we do it that way. Yeah, that makes perfect sense really. And as I venture into my own truffle dog training world, and, and I think there's a, and, and I guess yourself and hopefully me one day being a trainer, I think, it's all very well figuring out a solution that works for one dog and but maybe your dog is like at a certain caliber or maybe they just come out of the litter and they're like super super freak dog at finding truffles but how do you then come up with a yeah. philosophy that caters right. to the full spectrum of dogs and different different right. you know behaviors attitudes and and so it makes complete perfect sense to to do to do what you're doing you know what why wouldn't you set yourself up for success and quick question on the truffle oils is that so i mean truffle oil i guess the, the common thing is or the myth is that it's actually a lot of it is made with real truffle oil but are your different scented species scented truffle oils are they are they just an artificially re reproduced um scent or are you just how do you know what's the process yeah, so it's it's a really good question. I mean, what you're alluding to is most commercially purchased truffle oils are synthetic in nature with an added compound of 2,4-diethylpentane or whatever it is, so maybe another one. Like sometimes yeah. there's two volatiles they put in. Um, no, ours are done organically. So the, the short kind of description of what we do, we use a neutral-based carrier oil. So we use grapeseed oil because it's pretty neutral. It doesn't, it's not olive oil. It doesn't have other aromatics in it. Um, and then we basically use a vacuum and, and a headspace kind of chamber to get those aromas. Like a met, the cheap version of this, take your Tupperware container, get a smaller Tupperware container, put it in it, fill that up with grapeseed oil, take your truffles that you want, put them next to it, not touching, seal it, shove it in the fridge for a week. Mm. Those aromas from the off-gassing from those truffles will go into the oil because it binds with anything that has fat in it. Um, and then it is now stored in that oil. Will it dissipate over time? Yes, it will. Um, but that is essentially what we use for training. And so we say essentially, you know, we ask you to keep it in the fridge usually because the volatiles don't burn off as quickly that way. Um, but it's not a synthetic additive that we put in or, or like a chemically derived additive even. It, it's made from the actual lots of truffles that we find and we use for this process. Yeah. Love that. Love that. And and with them, um, when you're using sm small chunks of real truffle, um, I guess the question is as well is because I've got some frozen in the freezer um, yeah. and I'm guessing what what's the 
best use case of you're using frozen truffles in terms of how long should you get rid of them or how, how effective are they you know <laughs> yeah because i've got some i've got one yeah. there that's two years old that i'm thinking that's probably well past it but i'm thinking of doing a youtube video on where i just eat it um but we'll see <laughs> <laughs> bold move bold yeah. move um yeah the um you know the, i think again there was a study that the aromas do dissipate over time you know when you freeze them so it'll change over time so like if you take a summer truffle and you freeze it it does develop slightly different aromas kind of that more honey notes than you get when they're fresh out of the ground right you lose some of those volatiles so you know i think it's fine to use them in training again if you're of the philosophy of we're, we're building a wide odor array so your dog will run frozen but when you have fresh available You'll work them on fresh stuff too and you'll still work them on oil as well too you're giving a dog a lot of different things to work on so i'd say it's okay um we do use a lot of frozen truffle obviously when it's off season because it's not practical to have fresh truffle around all the time same reason we have oil um so you know it we always tell people pull the truffle out smell it make sure it smells like it's supposed to um and then it's probably okay to use right but we do tell people don't like thaw it use it frozen put it back in the freezer if you thaw it they just they start to get really gnarly and decay a lot faster um so even if you're burying it or doing stuff like that it's really going to be about consistency and does it still have some of those aromas to you that you can detect as being what is typical of the species and you want the dog to find right but again i think variety at that stage is good so you know if you're using a lot of frozen truffle maybe find a truffle oil or make one during the summer months coming up with some of your own that you can use um, and then use fresh stuff when you have it and then use frozen when you don't have access to that kind of stuff as well too love that i'm glad you said that bit about um don't let it thaw out because that would have been my go-to no. thought <laughs> no 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 they get gross real fast and you know when they go bad because they smell they have a very particular uh uh like beach ocean smell and not in a good way like mm. decaying you know matter and that Dying that is not a good smell, smell. Oh, oh. correct yeah oh, okay. yeah not good uh, yeah nice. um l let me ask you i know you said you're very interested in the science and the research and as it relates mm -hmm. to truffles and things and and what at the moment um is getting you lit up is is, is it exciting you with regards to research and uh, truffles yeah um you know i would love to see more dog studies done on olfaction specifically relating to truffles mm. um obviously there are studies done in the in the canine scent world about you know receptors and all that kind of stuff and i try to keep on top of that um uh but when it comes to truffles i mean there's a couple of teams working on you know what is it the dogs are are smelling kind of like that that team in germany who is working on you know what are the volatiles the dogs are actually detecting is there a commonality amongst these that that we think the dogs are, are pulling out um i think dr thomas um who you talked to i think a couple months ago is working on one that is um the protocols are essentially working the dog through the same area day after day what are they pulling from different areas? Like what is their regrowth rate on some of these truffles and in terms of how fast they ripen and what dogs are finding. In terms of our Northwest stuff, I would love to see studies done on the actual volatiles that are in those truffles because I'd really like to know, like just out of curiosity, what are all those different VFCs that are floating around in these, these organisms? And I, and I haven't seen a lot of published research on it. I know it's been done to some degree, but I haven't seen a lot of it. So, you know, that is interesting to me when you say um, when you say there's a lot of stuff what, yeah, the, what are the volatiles do you mean like what are their names and what are their unique identifiers or what are their sort of functions or purposes or, or... i would say both i mean i'm curious about the different compounds at like a molecular level and and um how that expresses itself in a truffle so i'm really looking at it from a dog olfaction mm. not necessarily what is its function within the truffle itself mm um but more about how it expresses so that we can try to hone how our dogs hunt for it and kind of refine that process like what is it that the dogs are actually smelling in this you know can we train on different concentrations of things for different environments and create dogs that are really hyper attuned to certain kinds of concentrations right much like you would do they do for um like narcotics detection it's it's similar to 
if you were to take a dog who's training to find like cocaine, let's say, they mix it in different concentrations with other kinds of compounds um, and, and, you know, working the dogs on that kind of variety. And so I'd love to see more specific with someone what it is in these truffles that the dogs are actually indicating on. And so we can practice what does that look like when we, when we flex that odor spectrum, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Um, oh, go on. It's no, go ahead. Like, um, I was going to ask. Well, yeah, you... yeah, yeah. No, no, go on. <laughs> No, I, just, I have a million things I could talk about. I mean, the only other thing that I think is interesting, it's not truffle related, but the dog related stuff. I mean, there's a lot of studies that are going on for medical research and dog detection. So, I mean, I think in the UK, you have dogs now certified to be able to do cancer detection mm. um, uh, with NHS. And um, here in Washington, actually, we have a, a lab who's working on early Parkinson's detection with dogs. Um, and so stuff like that, I think, is really interesting, too, just from a, like an olfaction and, and kind of um, use for, for canine, canine companions. Amazing. Yeah, no, I, I think it's bizarrely fascinating and amazing and astound, ast astounding, astounding that dogs can do that. And then humans have learned that yeah. dogs can do that. And we've actually put it to that sort of use, which is which is mad. Um, yeah. What, how many dogs have you got at the moment and what are they and what are their names? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, currently, me personally, I have just three at the moment. Um, just I three. have an Australian. Oh, yeah, God. just three. <laughs> plenty, plenty, yeah. plenty, plenty. We'll have to get a new puppy here in the next couple of years. And I'm just like, okay. Um, <laughs> breeds for that or rescue or whatever. But um, yeah, so my dogs are all older right now too. So my oldest is an Australian Shepherd. Um, his name is Ryu. He is essentially a, um, a an adorable couch ornament. He doesn't do much anymore. He hangs out and you know barks at the mailman and runs around the yard, but he doesn't really truffle hunt much anymore. He's got some stuff going on, so he chills. Um, and then I have uh, Ruby, who is a field golden. Um, she's ten. She's technically my husband's dog that I like appropriated for use for this at a much later age. Um, and, and then, um, I have Lolo, who is a Lagoto Romagnolo. So, um, and she's 11 now too, but you would not guess, like she is still go, 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 go. Um, and, um, they're fun. They, they have very different personalities. So when we take students out with our dogs at the advanced level, I like to have students see both of them work because they're very, very different. Ruby is very slow and methodical. Um, and thoughtful and very sensitive, um, but it's a very different kind of slow process moving through the woods versus going out with Lolo, who's like a rocket and you have to run to keep up, right? Mm. So it's very different. And, and part of that is to show people, hey, your dogs have personalities too. We try to work with them within their own their own boundaries, right? It's a relationship between you and your dog. And so, um, so yeah, so they're very different. They're all very good at what they do, but they're just, they're very, very different dogs. So very sweet. You know, very very nice that you have that uh, that difference then to show people. Which yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, they're very different. Um, what I was going to ask you is um, for beginners who you, you're training up, <clears throat> what are the um, one or two most common um, things that people just struggle to get? Um, you know, maybe they've been on a whole course with you, or maybe mm -hmm. they're just coming in new and. What are the what are the one or two things that just keep coming up that people struggle to get, but once they get it, you know that they're, they're on they're on a roll. Um, you know that is a really good question. Um, you know, I see a variety of things that kind of come through or things that we like to focus on in the early stages because we know that when you get to the field, it becomes very important. So, um let me frame it this way is that we really encourage really strong foundations because as you start to go through this process it gets more complicated and if um when you get to the field everything just kind of like explodes into chaos so if the dogs if you don't have really solid foundations it just goes haywire yeah. so everything gets sloppier as you go so we try to build really precise really strong foundations with some skills um yeah, and we drill that into people. And I know a lot of people want to push farther, faster, sooner. 
But if you do that, you end up having to take steps back anyway. And so that is maybe one thing that we see with people who come in from outside of our training program, because we really drill it into people and we tell them why, and we show them why we show them end behaviors and we show, Hey, if you don't do this now, this is what happens. And it will make your life a lot easier if you spend the time early on practicing these things. Um, Give an example of an end behavior that you'd show and people would get wrong. Uh, A few of them. So one of them, um, and this applies for for wild hunting, I would think anywhere, although, you know, your truffles over there are a little bit different than ours. But um, uh, some of the key things that we teach early on, because it takes a while to build this duration as well, too, is um, uh, nose on source. So whether that is holding a nose on a target or coming back and hitting it repeatedly ideally precisely, but we work on that over time. Um, And then staying with you at the truffle until you're ready to move on. So these things don't come out of the ground necessarily like in two seconds. It can take a minute or two to dig them up. It can take quite a bit longer sometimes depending how deep they are. You know, there were some this year that were multiple feet down. So um, teaching the dog to stay with you because if the dog is not with you and they're off finding five more, you're not going to find any of them. So teaching the dog to be patient and be with you and present from early on and also to put their nose on source. Um, Those are two of the things that we see get sloppier as time goes on in the field. And if you build it really strong in the beginning, it makes your life just a million times easier later. So um, we like people to learn from our mistakes over the years. And that's one of the ones that that we see. Because like I had to teach Lolo retroactively to stay at source. And that was, it's still a challenge sometimes. So it's training is always continually evolving with your dogs and every dog's different. But yeah, a couple of the things that we see that are really important if you can teach it early on is staying at source and then uh, pinpointing. Ideally with nose because it's the most precise thing a dog has. Digging is great, fine, that's cool. It can be part of your um, alert sequence, but to be really precise, you have to know where it is and, and the nose is the most precise thing that they have. And in terms of um, breaking those two things down to their most basic building blocks, um, mm-hmm. if you were to train, if you were to teach somebody who whose dog doesn't stay at source or whose dog is not pinpointing, um, what, mm-hmm. what would be the one or two steps you would say that they should revert yeah. back to and start? Yeah, so let's start with staying at source. So, um, you know, I would say, um, depending on where you're at in your training, um, go back a few steps, go to a less distracting environment. So go back inside your house, go to your yard, go to your garden, whatever it is, have a leash on your dog. So we use long lines. Um, you know, you will allow the dog about a six foot of line. You'd hold on to it. Then the dog indicates fine truffle. Great. You reward them. They then start dashing off all the way. You, you don't pull them back. You grab it, you hold it allow them to make the choice to re-engage with you. If a dog makes a choice on their own to re-engage, it's going to be a stronger learning experience than you being like, hey, come back here and do this. So give them the option to to make that decision. So you're shaping a behavior, essentially. You can try to encourage that, but try not to cue them and be like, hey, come back here and do this. Try to let them figure it out on their own and process and be like, rewards happen if I stay here. And then you just have to build that over time, over and over and over. And it does get easier. And with more repetitions and reward history, it keeps happening more and more and more. And then, you know, this follows other training principles, but then you stand up and it gives them that release to move on to the next one. And that's a reward in and of itself Mm -hmm. as well, too. So you're back chaining all of these things and kind of building it in. So that's kind of staying at source is you want to make it in their interest to stay there. I mean, you can keep feeding them a lot. There's a lot of tactics you can do to do that. But again, having them choose to opt in I think is important. Um, in terms of nose on source, we teach this as one of the first things that we do. Mm. Um, so like, here's your truffle. <laughs> For those of you listening on the radio, it's m- my AirPod case is acting <laughs> like truffle. But you essentially are taking a treat. And it, this is easier with treats, but you can do it with dogs and toys too. You just have to modify it. Um, but you're really waiting until they actually engage with their nose on it and then rewarding them for that. And it's, just, it's a lot of repetition in a very basic environment. So I still play this game with my dogs in my kitchen. I'll take a truffle. I'll literally drop it on the ground in front of them. I don't care if they see it. They get rewarded, not if they're nearby, but if their nose actually touches it. And then I make a big deal about it. And then I reward them, usually at source, as close to source as possible. Um there's times when you don't want to do that, but essentially 
anytime they engage with it and can give you a more precise behavior, you just keep building that. And then you start taking it into slightly more complex environments, right? So, um, but that is a skill that just that repeat it, either a nose hold or that nose touching on source, just practice that even in your kitchen, just holding it in your hand for 10 seconds. That's all you have to do. Um, just keep keep at it and keep doing it and it builds over time. I love that. And in your opinion, like, cause there's, I guess there's different uh, outcomes that you can expect or want from your dog when they find a truffle, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, do they dig for it or do they sit or do they nose point? And, and do you have like an ideal, um, you know, so if the dog was this type of character, the ideal one, and he's trained up really well, like, you know, sure. and you want a really nice life as a truffle hunter going around the woods and get as many <laughs> truffles in, in the most efficient time and have a great time, and you want your dog to have a great time, what, what would be that yeah. ideal um, sequence? <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's, again, you're, you're asking really good questions, because there's, there's that, and then there's the reality of the situation. Yeah. So, um, you know, I like to work with dogs within their own personalities and be able to um, kind of cultivate that into something that works for us as a team. You know, in an ideal world, I could be standing there, my dog would go dig it up, grab it, bring it to me. Like, that would be wonderful. Um, there's a lot of challenges with that, and I'm not necessarily willing to put the time and energy into training that you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want a robot to necessarily do that. Anytime a truffle goes near a dog's mouth as well, too, there's a propensity for it to go down the hatch. And so there's a lot of training that would have to go into modifying that and really shaping it really correctly. Um, I much prefer to work with the dog's natural tendencies. So um, in answer to your question, um, which is essentially what do you want as an alert? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it varies based on what you're hunting for and where you are. So um, I have different alerts that I want in a truffle orchard setting um, and a different behavior set than I do in the wild. So the two disciplines I like to equate to, um, uh, uh, like, let's see, um, like working on a truffle orchard or a um, troupier is equivalent to um, racing a bike in a velodrome, really high speed, sleek bike. Wild hunting is like mountain biking off road, really like aggressively over terrain. They both require bicycles to do, but they're very different. They're very different deployments of the sport. So in the wild, what we like the dogs to do is to be able to locate source, dig to source until they can access it, pinpoint on source, and then wait for their reward. That is an ideal behavior. So they can, whether that, if it's half an inch down, then they don't really have to dig. They just put their nose on it, right? Mm. If it's a foot down, they dig until they get to it, till they locate it, and then they poke it with their nose and then they pop back out of the hole and look to you for their reward. Be like, hey, I did it. And when you ask them, ideally you don't even have to ask them. They'll be pushy enough. They just keep going back to you and be like, right there, mom, where's my snack? You can't see it, where's my snack? Um, which happens a lot, right? They, they're hard to see in the, our native blacks are especially hard to see in the soil. And so the dogs are like, oh, you idiots, it's right here. Um, but dig to source, access it, poke it with nose, and then get out of the way so that we can actually dig it out. And then wait for us until we're ready to move on. That would be an ideal sequence. Um, on a truffle orchard, it depends on what is needed at that time. I like our dogs who work on truffle orchards to be flexible and be able to take a lot more direction if needed. So that's a lot more me pointing at trees and really guiding that search. I want you to look at this row. Um, sometimes we want them to dig, a lot of times we don't. Um, and so if a dog can indicate on an area, okay, okay, great, I'll drop a marker. We will actually come back later and dig it up without the dog there. Um, the dog is really used as a locating service in that capacity. There are times we will bring a dog back and actually ask them to dig, to do what we do in the wild, which is to access it because we can't find it. Um, but on a truffle orchard, we want to be really, really conscious and careful of dogs not damaging them. So it's what I like to call, you know, the autograph, like the, the toenail right through the middle. Um, I say you pay extra for those. Um, but we, it's, the Lolo, it's the Lolo special. Um, <laughs> But uh, hmm, yeah, on orchards, we don't really like them to dig. We like them to indicate whether that's a nose or just like a foot tap. It's fine. Um, uh, and then in the wild, I actually want them to be able to access it and help us get it because they can be really, really deep. 
we've had some, we had a record breaking one this year that was three feet down, um, which is absurd. Uh, we don't normally find stuff that deep, but because of the heat and everything that's been going on the last couple of years, the last couple of years, especially early in the season, a lot of the stuff we were finding was like a foot and a half down, if not more. So um, it's it's hard to dig that out without the dog. And also- Was this you, oh, was this you that found that one or someone, what was yeah. going through your head when you were yeah. you know, going past foot one, foot two? Oh. <laughs> Were you thinking, am I really, am I really finding a truffle this deep? <laughs> what is this I dog mean, saying to me? Can and you do. Yeah, I mean, we trust them, right? Yeah. So, so sometimes they will indicate on something and I can't find it. That's not her problem. That's mm -hmm. my problem. So I am comfortable enough with my dogs at this stage too, to just trust them and be like, I'm sure there's something here, Lolo. I'm not going to find it. Is it worth my time and energy for these next 15 minutes to try to dig it out? or just reward you and move on and go to something else, right? The dogs do have frustration levels. Like this year there was one, it was only two and a half feet down, but it was still really deep. Um, Lolo found it. She got real frustrated with me at one point and basically was like, I'm done doing this. And I was like, okay, that's fine. We can come back and look for it later. Um, Cause I was real determined to get that one. Cause I could smell it. I just couldn't, we couldn't find it. And this is what I was gonna say is like odor, uh, odor can come out, I'm gonna use my little diagram. Odor can come out right here. The truffle can actually be located two feet away based on soil conditions. And so you need the dog to be able to re-pinpoint in the soil and kind of dig mm. to it. So there was one that was like two and a half feet down. It was under some roots. Lolo got real frustrated. <clears throat> She's 11 and I, you know, I created some of these habits myself. So it's on me. Um, I was like, okay, fine. I'll just, you're right. I'm not going to find it. We had another dog there who is really good at being really persistent and determined and it took them like 20 minutes but Enzo was eventually able to get down to it and pinpoint where it was Lolo was just sick and tired of trying to do it at that point and I wasn't going to make her do that like it's it's a relationship I don't if she's not having fun and she's getting really frustrated I don't want to push her through that it's okay it's not worth it so you have to really understand your dog and their behavior um and how to work them through some of those things but also uh when to when to call it and be like this just isn't this isn't worth it for our relationship for the truffle itself, you know, you also can dig down a foot and a half and find something the size of a pea. So like, there's that happens too, where you're like, cool, that's awesome. So, um, well, and we, and we don't like to dig really, really deep in general. Anyway, I don't want to disturb that much soil. So when you're going down two feet, that's a big hole, right? That we have to fill back in. Um, and so I don't love doing the stuff that's massively, massively deep. Usually I call it, um, but if the dog is really, really persistent, I'll let them go a little bit and just and just see if we can locate it. But there, I will often cut it off after a certain depth and just be like, this isn't, it's just not worth it. I don't want to disturb that much. Um, you know, again, it might be the size of a pebble. It's, it's just not worth it. Amazing. And with similar question then, but I guess more from for the advanced um, people that you work mm -hmm. with or people going through your advanced training, like what are one or two of the things that you most commonly see coming up as things that people are struggling with um, as it relates to, to hunting truffles? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, let's see. Um, I mean, staying at source continues to be one for a lot of folks. Um, trusting your dog, um, overworking them. Mm. So early on in when you get to those advanced stages, um, you know, I'm a very practical trainer in the, in the vein of, you know, if you're going to be out hiking with your dog, are you expecting them to hunt that entire time? What is your reality? How do you morph this fun activity? Because it's supposed to be a fun like game for you guys to play, not a job, right? How do you morph this into your lifestyle and make it work for you? Um, we do see people taking their dogs out and working them for really long periods of time. And that can be detrimental to training, um, as well as just your relationship sometimes with your dog. If they're out having fun, that's fine. Um, but, you know, when we first start taking um, kind of the prerequisite before we take people out to the field, um, and we go to known locations where we know there's a bunch to find, um, and you're going to have a high rate of success and reward history. So that's why we do that. Um, to kind of build that within within students' repertoire. 
Um, but we really expect dogs to not work more than 15, 20 minutes in, in a focused environment like that in the forest. There's a lot going on. It's really hard for them. So you build that over time. Me with my dogs and our dogs as part of our team members, we'll work for maybe an hour and a half, maybe two. That's the absolute max. But you have to build up to that. You can't just take a dog and plop them down in the forest and expect them to go to work right away when you're a green team. It's just not realistic. That's asking a lot of the dog, right? A lot of these dogs need to get used to the environment. There's a lot of different smells. Um, some dogs do what we call mapping, where they actually will run around and find a bunch, but not actually tell you yet until they've taken the time to kind of mentally process and calm down, and then they'll take you back and go find them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, the most common things I see are people overworking their dogs, probably working them too long. Um, and what that leads to is sloppy behaviors and just different challenging situations that you kind of have to undo later. So uh, working your dogs too long um, with our with our native black truffles, the dogs like to eat them often. So that's a fun one. Um, so we work with people on their dogs not eating them. Um, and that's there can be a lot of reasons that happens, but usually it means you're not fast enough to, to keep up with your dog and not reading their signal. So, um, so that's part of it too. Um, I think that was a common, that's really it. Just, you know, resilience, like everybody progresses at a different rate. Everybody's different. Everybody's dogs are different. Everybody's relationship is different with their dogs. So one of the things, um, we're really good about drilling this into people early on too, is don't compare yourself to others. It's a, it's an individual journey for you, right? Um, just because somebody has a dog that can pop out of the car and, and be like amazing at it, you know, for some people, it takes more time and to build confidence in their dog to do that. So, um, don't try to compare yourself to somebody else. You'll get there. Um, and, and this is why we tailor what we do to help different dogs and different teams at different levels. Um, there's different things that, that individuals need in order to support, to build confidence. And a lot of that's honestly just reward history so you know in the uk where you are like you said you have a friend or somebody you can go out with to an actual producing location i mean i think one of the best things anybody who's learning to do this can do is when you get to that advanced stage is if you have a friend who can take you out to a known location where you know there will be stuff to find it can be incredibly beneficial for you and your dog um because you're just building those reward histories and what I would actually have your friend do in an environment like that is if you're out finding them and let's say your friend's name is Jim and Jim and his dog go and find one, they actually would leave that truffle in the hole and then go find another one and leave that in the hole and maybe put a flag there or something so you know where it is. And then you get to come up with Buddy and practice finding it in that hole with the truffle still there. Like that can be really, really impactful for a lot of dogs and really help in their training process. So we do a lot of that at the advanced mm. stage both with our own dogs picking them out, but like oftentimes we'll go out with my dog early before class, I'll tag a couple of things so we at least know generally where some are, although there's more there. Um, and then my dog will go away and then we'll work with you um, on, on you know where the disconnect is, why your dog is not sourcing it, are they eating it, like what's going on? Yeah, I can definitely uh, speak to that because that's exactly what happened um, just in December, went out into, um... mm -hmm. I was with Melissa Waddingham, who's who, who I'm also partnered yeah. with, really, in hosting this uh, UK Truffle Festival, actually, which we're just excited about launching round yeah. two this year, which is cool. Um, yeah. yeah. She she did pretty much exactly what you just described, and then lo and behold, we were sniff. Although I think she pocketed the truffles, and I just let Buddy go and sniff the truffle scented hole and treated mm -hmm. him, but then after a, a short while, he ended up finding his own one, which was pretty cool. Um, and I caught it on camera as well, and I still haven't posted that. Yeah, need to. That's <laughs> a big deal. That's great. I was well, going to ask you. And oh, I do want to say congrats. Well, no, I did want to say congratulations on like doing that truffle festival. I know how hard those are to put on. So, round of applause from over here on doing all that. I think it's great you're doing that, and and um, a great resource as well for everybody over there. Thank you. Yes, and I think once once we're perhaps bit bigger and a bit more established we'd uh, love to have you invited over as a special guest I'd love to, <laughs> yeah, um, love to. <laughs> thank you for that and um, one question i had whilst you were talking there is um i think if you read any scent dog training book and stuff um one of the things you'll probably pick up is the importance of not 
you know scent contamination and you know people can go down the end of the routes and wearing gloves and being very very careful with how you um you know handle scent and things like that and how much of that yep. uh element of scent training do, comes in to what you, you what you do because i know for me i was very blase <clears throat> about it I and mean, i was just like pouring truffle oil sure. all over things and like you know sure. god knows what sure. was happening but um you know in an sure. ideal world what would you what would you say to people who should do yeah so, I mean, there's a lot of ways to get to the same end results, too. Yeah. So I want to say that, right? Just because we do something a certain way doesn't mean you can't achieve those results in a different capacity. So I want to be very clear about that. So we talk to our students. It's a very common question about, like, my odor. Is the dog just finding my odor? Um, us as instructors, we we can pick up on that really quickly if that's what the dog is actually doing. Um, we consider truffle hunting what we call an odor messy sport. So when you're actually truffle hunting and you're out in these environments, um, you know, you're going to have truffle odor on your hands if you're picking them up. It's going to be in your pocket. It's going to be in your backpack or your side pouch or wherever you're keeping it. Your dog needs to learn that it only counts in certain uh, specific circumstances. So the dog gets rewarded when truffle is on the ground or in a hand, essentially, and that's it. Um, and so they have to get used to the odor being kind of everywhere, and they only really get rewarded at source. So this goes back to one of the things you were talking about with like trace odor as well too. Early on, it's fine to reward on trace odors, but at the later stages, we see a lot of truffles in the woods that are like little bits and pieces and stuff like that too. Fine if the dog goes to that, I'm not gonna reward on it anymore. I really need the dog to find the source of the truffle, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we have ways that we handle that um, at that kind of transition stage. It's like, if you're not sure it's there, we always go out with a little, um, like a metal tin with a piece of truffle in it. You would put that in the hole, the dog alerts on that, they're still finding a source, and then you move on, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we consider it an odor messy sport. So, <clears throat> I mean, don't like rub it on your hands and like, you know, touch your entire environment. But um, we do do things in our training program to clue for stuff like that too, which also helps us as instructors understand if the dog is tracking you. Because um, a lot of dogs will, it's a crutch for them, right? They, they'll follow dad to where dad was and dad stood here for 20 seconds and they've associated, oh, well, if dad was here for 20 seconds, there's probably a truffle here, right? They're smart enough to understand that. Um, and so we have you do different things in training, like touching a lot of stuff in your environment, digging big holes, all kinds of stuff like that to try to prove for it. So I'm not overly concerned. It happens on occasion, but there's things you can do in those scenarios to prove for it. But again, we're working with a lot of dogs, both professionally as well as people with pet dogs doing this. So not even like dog sport folks or people interested in training, but just people who don't have a lot of other background in this. We try to make it as easy as possible for them. So it's great if you want to put the time and energy into wearing your, your latex nitro gloves and doing that. But I would say it's overkill in most mm. cases and not necessary. So if you want to, great. I don't want to discourage that. But um, I think in most situations, it doesn't really become an issue. I love that. Um, that's really cool. Um, I just mind blank on the next question I was going to ask you. But um, what is what is the um, what is the sequence of teaching? Because I think from a very broad level, you know, dogs know how to sniff, they know how to scent. And uh, what would you mm -hmm. share to people in terms of, you know, especially everybody who's looking to just run, run, oh, I scrap that. I remember what my question was, it's, it's better. Um, okay. You just mentioned there, uh, putting a truffle in a tin and having that round with you. And then, you know, if there was a hide or a mm -hmm. hole and nothing was in there to sneak that in there, whatever. And is that i guess that sounds like a good strategy as well if maybe your dog is not super pro yet but is good enough to go out into the field and you're not yep. yet you don't yet have a load of sites under your belt which you know are producing but you want to go and investigate but at the same time you don't want to water down the training you've already done um so yeah is there a process or it, what would be the best way to do that if you were going if i was going to new woodland everything looked right yeah um, i mean mm -hmm. i've done this before and i was sort of hoping buddy was just gonna like find truffles left right and center but he wasn't so right. fortunately i had a couple of yeah. truffles with me um but yeah mm -hmm. can you just speak to that and what is the what is the way that you yeah. try and find new territories with perhaps a dog that is yeah. still in the training phase a little bit is new 
Yeah, so there's a few things. Um, one, we tell for the first couple of years, I recommend you always, if you're going out with the intention of exploring stuff or doing anything like that, have a have a tin or two a target, is what we call them. Have a couple of those with you. Um, uh, you know, I technically don't really need it anymore for my dogs. Their situation, will they understand what they're doing? I will sometimes still have one. Um, but you're exactly right. If you're not finding anything, it can be really demotivating to the dogs, right? It depends on your dog's, um, you know, drive, perseverance, things like that, how often you need to put it down. But often I tell students at the early stage when, when you're kind of, it seems like at the, at the position you're at where you're exploring new territories, maybe you've found one or two, but you're not sure like if a new environment has it. Um, take those tins with you. If you want to do setups beforehand, you can hide a few of them out in that environment and like run your dog through the course, like they're going to find it, but have another one always on you to throw down. And I don't mean hide it. I, I mean, literally put it down in front of the dog, let them hit it and be successful. Um, you're not going to undo your, all of the other training that you've done, teaching them to figure out complex problems in the forest. What you are going to do is just keep them motivated and engaged and having fun with you and getting rewards, right? They're out there trying to do this for a variety of reasons internally, which we can't always know. Um, but if you throw that tin down, they hit on it, they get rewarded, great. Um, people sometimes don't throw it down enough. So I honestly say every five minutes, if you're not finding something, the dogs need really high rates of reinforcement early on in this process. If you wait too long between reinforcing, it's really hard on them. They get bored, they get frustrated, and we don't want to push those boundaries too much early on. So um, when we take people first out kind of at that stage, it's high rates of reinforcement, a lot of reward history. So a lot of finding stuff over and over and over again. As you get more confident with time, you can start spacing those out every five minutes, one every 10 minutes, whenever your dog looks like they need it. But again, don't make it difficult. That doesn't mean it hiding it under a fern or a bush necessarily. It means literally just throwing it down on the ground and letting them be successful. And that's okay. You're not doing anything wrong with that. Um, and sorry. And in terms of you doing that, yeah. are you, um, is, it, is, it, is it right? So you've, are you giving them a, a cue or a command to hunt for truffles and then you're throwing it down then or you're throwing it down and then giving them a cue or... or can you just talk get a bit more detail? About doesn't it doesn't matter necessarily. I mean, yeah. So gen generally speaking, we have three cues or commands in truffle hunting. And, and this is going to vary how you deploy them based on your dog's personality to some mm. degree. Uh, the first is, let's go find the truffles. Where are they? Oftentimes people pick different words that you're not going to find somewhere else. Um, but like, let's go find it. The next one is show me exactly where it is. So it's a re-alert behavior. So like the dog has dug that hole. I can't find it. Where is it? Right? Show me again. And then the last one is essentially all done. It's pretty much all you need. So in terms of <laughs> um, doing them and searching. And just for anyone who was listening there, there was some really yeah. great hand signals going on when uh, Lana Sorry. was doing that. No, 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 it's all good. It's all, yeah, yeah. It's nice a lot of gesturing. I speak, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I speak with, speak with my hands. Um, so um, when you are taking your dog out and you're throwing those tins down, um, I think shouldn't have if they if they're let me backtrack if your dog is working and they look like they're working you don't need to be cueing them to find something if they look like they're hunting you don't have to say hey go find this um you can just throw it down and they come across it and reward them right if they're struggling and they're checking back to you for information yes you can cue them again and be like okay go find it what i want to be conscious of there too is you want to be a little bit careful about i would say don't throw the tin down and then say go find it immediately because then they're gonna they're gonna associate those two things together as like oh there's a tin here every time dad says that so i i would try to just put it down without cueing them and see if they can locate it but again you're not making this hard you're not hiding it you're literally putting it in front of them and then when they touch it or engage with it or dig on it you're rewarding that for su for success essentially um to, to I think where your other question was going with this too, and, and it, it's, it's relevant to this, um, to this conversation is, you know, one of the things we really like to cultivate in dogs is independent um, confidence and problem solving. And so I don't want the dogs constantly checking in with me for what they should be doing. So if you have a young dog or a puppy, you certainly don't need one. But if you do have a puppy, the things that 
we work on with puppies is essentially independent problem solving skills. And how do you create a really independent dog that doesn't look to the human for cues on how to operate in their environment necessarily, right? The thing I see with a lot of obedience trained dogs and then trying to convert into truffle hunting is they're looking to their human for all of their their um, commands and cues and what they're supposed to be doing. That's fine, um, but I find it's not as effective long-term. So we want dogs that are able to go out into an environment and be able to independently problem solve, source odor on their own, and then indicate and tell us. Um, and so it's relevant to the conversation we were having because if you are cueing your dog constantly to find it, A, it's just distracting. B, they're waiting for your command, essentially, in order to exhibit and elicit a behavior. Whereas I want a dog to take them out into the forest, maybe I give them that initial cue, but then they're working. Mm. And and I don't have to remind them that they're working unless they're checking in with me for, for reassurance. And so that can happen sometimes. And you can do words of encouragement and stuff like that too. Like I, for example, I wish I could show you a video of this. I probably have it somewhere where like, I can see my dog is, is hit the odor cone of something and is working it, but she's having a hard time. I'm like, you can do this, right? Mm. You can do this, but I'm not saying find it, find it, find it. I'm saying supportive words like, oh, you, yeah. you're, you're going to get there. Do you need me to move this stuff out of the way? Things like that, right? It's different. It's a really, it's a conversation, yeah. but it's not me asking her to do something over and over and over again. Does that make sense? A hundred percent makes a lot of sense. I mean, it was going to be my, the next question I asked you was, um, <laughs> I don't do this with Buddy. I'm, I'm in fact, I'm more in the, on the fence of you say a cue once and then I shut, shut the hell up mm -hmm. and just let him work. And yeah. for, fortunately he does. Yeah. He's a very persistent worker. Good. Um, but then I've seen other things where people are like, find it, find it, find it, find it, find it. And, uh, I'm like, yeah like what's going on there and uh, <laughs> yeah but, but yeah, maybe yeah. that's their encouraging word i don't know but no, well, i don't think so <laughs> well i would yeah i think i think you're much more along the lines of what i would recommend which is you know we often say and we have to remind people of this and we're like stop talking right if yeah. your dog is working stop talking they're working right yeah. again words of encouragement are fine but if you're using your q word over and over and over again that's not encouragement. You're just using the Q word over and over and over again. And then it loses meaning for your dog as well, too. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a double-edged sword on that one. So I would recommend people don't do that and do more of what you're doing, which is give them, give them the Q to go work. And if they look like they're working, great. If they're checking back in with you and they, like, got confused or they got distracted by something, like, what are we doing now, Dad? Then sure, go ahead and use it again. But constant talking to them um can be distracting to the dog too and it doesn't necessarily serve a purpose so um when you're out with us usually it's pretty quiet like if it's just us and i'm not like talking to you showing you stuff while we're out there i don't I, i'll talk to the dog occasionally be like you got something or you know things that come naturally out but i'm not constantly telling her to find it over and over it's a pretty quiet experience nice what do you love most about um doing what you're doing now and training training people to teach dogs and everything else you're doing with truffles but yeah dog stuff yeah you know there's um there's a lot that i like about it i mean it, it's really fun to see people develop relationships with their dog um and to learn how to communicate with each other and i think that's something that nose work in general is a great sport for is teaching you and and your dog you know how to communicate effectively and read their body language that's one of the big things for me is um, you, people understanding body language of their dog because they give us so many signals. They can be very subtle sometimes. And so if you're not looking for it, you don't see it. So I think that is one of my favorites is seeing uh, relationships grow from that and the confidence both within the humans and the dogs that come from these kinds of scenarios and setups that we do um, with nose work is really fun. Um, you get to meet all kinds of cool people. So, you know, it's just it's fun i mean obviously i i like people um and so um it's fun just to get to meet new people and do that and so i really like that and then um it, it's fun to watch people be successful and then kind of go out on their own and find stuff and i mean we've strived really hard to to build a community around this because again when i first started there was like nobody doing it so it's been really important to us to build um, a very transparent community about it because i know in europe really secretive in a lot of ways right and i think that's something that's really big for us too is to be able to try to take away the barriers and make this accessible to people 
Um, how do you find locations? What does that look like? How do you sustainably take care of them? Um, so that it takes away some of that secrecy and barriers to entry so that it's accessible to everybody. And so that's something I think that I really enjoy too is the community that we've developed. We've had a lot of people go through classes who they found like new best friends in like part of the classes that they've been in, right? And so that's fun to get to watch people's relationships develop. So I'd say that's probably the the dog and human relationship and then just the, the community that's been built around it, I think is something that I've really, really enjoyed. And then honestly, just being out in the woods, like let's yeah. be real, like that's lovely and fun. And you know, I like foraging for other stuff and learning about mushrooms. Um, you know, I came to the mushroom world from the truffle side, so I know a lot about truffles learning about mushrooms and that's been fun just foraging and going out and doing that but anytime you can be outside and enjoy nature with your dog and explore some of these areas I like going to new places and exploring stuff um that's always really fun and to get to share that with people that's one of my favorite things is we take groups out to go do this so like I imagine this happens in the UK too you take people on like truffle hunts like you do in Italy right we do that here and that's one of my favorite things is taking people even if they don't have dogs out to go see what like what it's like um and that's always really fun too awesome and i know you've um I, well i think you've been out to europe and done hunt some hunting out there and stuff and um, can you speak to a what was that experience or experiences and what sort of hunting have you done <laughs> and then what yeah. surprised you about that and what was different about you know what you're used to over in the states yeah you know i'd like to do more of it in europe um i did this last fall actually go out with um some some um some french farmers um who grow on on truffle orchards in france and that it's just fun to see their operation it's really similar to what we do here in the us um but it was fun to talk to them and again industry is really small we all know each other so um that was fun you know the first time i went out um was a long time ago i'd like to say it's where i learned about truffles um was in Italy um, with a very shaggy, which I then learned later was a Lagoto, but a very, very shaggy, scruffy Muppet um, out in the hills in like the Marquet area. So for those people who don't know, it's like Tuscany, but up and over the mountains with slightly less tourists. Um, and uh, I did a semester in Italy when I was in university college and uh, uh, took my family back. We did that kind of that food scene. It was fun. I mean, it was very, um, I think, reflecting back on it now with everything I know, um, I think my biggest takeaway would be the relationship that 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 hunter had with his dog, right? I didn't think about it at the time, but obviously they're like best friends, right? And they do everything together and it was just, you know, scruffy little Muppet and he um he spoke only italian and i was the only person in my family who could speak italian and so i was translating for everybody as best i could um but he was you know cracking jokes about you know his dog cost more than his <laughs> a lot of things anyway he was cracking jokes about the dog and just like the importance for stuff um and i think that that's my biggest takeaway is you know the hunters in europe the, the actual hunter hunters are a lot like a lot like here it's really people who enjoy being out in the woods being with their dogs um the truffles are kind of like an added bonus um but it's just a great way to kind of be out there and i think that's the biggest takeaway the other big takeaway is your habitats are very different to ours um and so that's one thing that i would love to go back i mean gosh i'd love to take my dogs over there and just like explore it would be super fun um i don't think that's going to happen but um it would be fun but your habitats your your woodlands look very different than ours um and so that was a big shift for me the stuff in italy versus the stuff in france versus the stuff in the uk um and i haven't been i've heard about places in the uk and i've driven through them but i haven't been out with dogs there so that would be super fun to go see dogs doing it in the uk i would really like um but yeah your habitats your woodlands are very pretty and big hardwoods and beech and oak and um that's not what we have <laughs> so ours are very dark and wet so Awesome. Well, I will, um, you know, whenever you're next over in the UK, hopefully I'll be a bit more up and running by yep. then and have some spots, you, you know, we'll definitely have to organize something. And also with regards to um, more Mediterranean stuff, I'm definitely gonna have to introduce you to um, my truffle hunter friend, Julie, uh, from the real truffle hunters.com. Yeah. She, 
she was also a guest that I had on my podcast, probably uh, guest number two or three. Yeah. Uh, she's from Liverpool originally, mm -hmm. but then um, married into a, a family in this secret place, can't say in, on, the, on the public airwaves, but yeah. she just, um, she's created the best experience of my life, bar none. She invited um, awesome. Danny and I out to go stay with them, like in their, in their house. We stayed in the you know, ground floor place. Um, and literally for a long weekend, like three and a half, four days nearly, sun up to sundown, I was white truffle hunting with um, awesome. uh, her her husband, um, her her husband and her, and her son. Yeah. And um, and she, I know she's thinking of um, you know, potentially launching some holiday type stuff as well. So yeah. like we were kind of their guinea yeah. pigs a little bit, uh, like all gratis yeah. as well. So like literally the most generous yeah. thing anybody's ever done for me. Yeah. And obviously as as a mushroom truffle dog nut it was just ridiculous she's got 12 dogs over there as well yeah so it was just a green so <laughs> it's a lot of dogs i'll definitely yeah. connect you guys because um you know something yeah. i know she's a fan of yours as well and she's asked some of the questions that i've asked you today actually so um yeah, yeah we'll do that and the other thing i was no, going to ask you go on sorry we're going to say something else no no, no go ahead no 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 nope. Nope. i was just going to ask you um you know because i was conscious of your time but i think we've pretty much hit the nail on the head with time but I was going to ask, what's what sort of next for you? Have you got any projects in in the pipeline, or is it more of the same? What, what's what's new happening with Truffle Dog <laughs> Company? Oh goodness! Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of projects in the pipeline. The question is, you know, it's a small business. What can you do, right? Yeah. You have to pick and choose. Um, uh, the one that's been lingering for a long time is I need to. We've been redoing our website for a long time. So if anybody visits us. I apologize it will be much better soon ish um so that's a big project i gotta get done but that's not like hunting fun that's like business stuff um you know we're trying to we've getting we're getting more and more involved in the tourism side so you're mentioning like julie might be interested in that i'm always happy to talk to people about our experiences having done this the past like six seven years mm. it's evolved um and the kind of events that we do and stuff like that so um we're already planning for next season essentially some of those big kind of um you know not like festivals but it's like you know the cool events that we yeah. do so um that stuff is going to be fun we're going to have some that we do on some of those truffle orchards um in oregon and california which is going to be fun so people in an ideal world we were we trialed it this year and it worked okay where you get to go truffle wild truffle hunting in the morning and then you get to go to one of the truffle orchards like in the afternoon and like have a fancy lunch and get to that because like they're very different experiences. Yeah. So um, we're gonna work a little bit more on that. Um, we're gonna we're gonna try to take a trip out to the East Coast to go see all the hunters out there and and like just see how we can help and and kind of build the industry out there um, because I think again it's it's small but starting and trying to figure out how we can help those folks. So. I mean, there's a million different things in the pipeline, but, um, and then I eventually have to get another dog. So I don't think this summer, but I'm, I'm starting to ponder what that is, um, with some anxiety about yeah. what to do. What to get. So thinking about that and, you know, um, I'd love to plan more trips to come to like Europe and do that. We are planning a trip, um, hopefully for next, if anybody wants to come next uh our next spring so next may june to go see the truffle orchards in australia oh, yeah, um, yeah. been down there once really cool experience if you haven't met i can happy introduce you to some of those folks they're really interesting stuff that they do down there um it's it's different um and so we're trying to maybe plan a trip and take some truffle folks down there for that which might be fun so i think that's kind of one of the longer longer term plans but yeah a lot of things in the works always a lot of things in the works amazing and um in terms of like parting words of wisdom for uh newbies people wanting to get into um uh, yeah. truffle hunting with their dog um i guess two two things here maybe maybe more from the some tips type of thing from like you know beginner perspective and yeah. expectations but then also like a message that you want to share i guess maybe more on what's important to you with regards to truffle industry side of things and possibly sustainability. I know you've mentioned a couple of times and, um, yeah, it re reminds me actually, um, sorry, just to squeeze into that question. Like, um, one of the things that I haven't forgotten to ask you actually was 
um, this idea of raking for truffles versus dogs and stuff. Ah. I know I've seen quite a lot of videos on US yeah. videos of this and um, maybe this is a whole other question actually, but um, yeah, can you speak no, to that? No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, you sure can. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so raking is a term. Um, so, you know, I sit in an interesting place in the industry where I understand the scientific side of some of these things. When people talk about raking in the U.S., they're not usually, so for people who don't know, in Europe, primarily animals are used to harvest truffles. So that's pigs, although pigs are rarely used anymore, but people do use them a little bit, especially in Eastern Europe. Um, <clears throat> dogs. In the U.S., um, the use of animals to find truffles is a relatively new occurrence. Mm. People used to find truffles by taking a garden rake out to the forest and then just ripping the forest floor off and then harvesting the truffles out. So when we say raking, that's what we mean. Some of the scientists do it and they do it very lightly and they replace the duff cover and they're doing it for scientific purposes. And I get that. And I don't, I really don't judge that. Um, when we refer to raking in the U S what we see happen is people taking rakes, going out to these forest environments and then going down, you know, six, eight inches a foot moving the entire forest floor, usually not replacing it. It's mm. usually trespassing. There's some other kind of stuff that goes on with this. Um, and it really damages the forest. So uh, it hurts our salmon streams. It kills the trees in some instances. Like it's really sad and gnarly when you come across it. Like it's heartbreaking. Um, there's a whole underbelly to this too. And mm. if you've ever read any of the, the, like those books and stuff like um, Ryan, Ryan Jacobs book. The Truffle Underground is one kind of, yeah. kind of same elements. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so the, the issue with raking is one, damaging to the environment. Two, the truffles that are harvested are, some are ripe, they are, but a bunch are not. And you can't really ripen truffles in the same way that you can anything else. So it's like, it's like picking a green tomato and expecting it to taste like a vine ripened tomato. It's just not the same. So for a long time, the truffles from the U.S. were considered really poor, um, really bad quality. Like, that's the connotation. And that's because the majority of truffles that were making it to market were these raked ones, which weren't ripe. I would still argue about 80% of all of the Pacific Northwest truffles that hit market are still not dog found. It's wow. a big issue in our industry. It's, it's education. Um, and this is one of the big things that we do is education, education to chefs um, on how do you tell what is, you know, a good product versus not. Ask if people are using dogs or not to find them. Like, how are they finding them? Understanding your sourcing. That's been a big movement in the last couple of years we started to see a little bit more traction on. But like I said, it's still about 80% that hit market are not actually found by animals. Um, so, you know, if you're finding them in a restaurant in the U.S., please ask if, you know, are they dog found, you know, do, you know, where are they come from? That kind of stuff can be super helpful to just start to get it into people's forefront. So, yeah, so that's raking. That's the short version. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a hot, it's a hot topic here. So it's, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, it's a and is, one. and is, um, so I'm guessing some of this is happening <laughs> in um, tree plantation areas um, and do people, yeah, I mean, what's the what's the thought process behind that? Is it people thinking, oh, well, it doesn't matter. This is a tree plantation area, or it's less damaging, or it's not wild nature. Or what, what's is that something that even comes yeah. into the conversation, or is it a mute point? I don't think it comes into the conversation, to be honest. Um, yeah. So the the true fears are one thing. We don't see raking on that. There's security issues can sometimes be an issue on those, but like really, really because they're growing paragord truffle, it's not natural here. Like everyone knows where the farms are. It's like, oh, if, if you're a random guy and you show up with a paragord, somewhere, they're like, where'd you get that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's different. But the, the tree plantations like you're talking about, which is where a lot of this happens, we have a ton of timber here in the Northwest. They are planted. They're, they're growing trees for harvesting, essentially. Um, I don't think it comes in the conversation that people just think it's like, okay, people just do it. Mm -hmm. um, there is a... You know, there's a whole socioeconomic element to this too. So I don't want to be insensitive to some of the things that go on out there, but um, I don't think, you know, people who often go out and go trespass on these properties to go do that are not taking that into consideration. So there have been some laws that have actually been passed in 
um, Oregon, not in Washington, but in Oregon, specifically around truffle harvesting. They were designed to try to help the dog harvesters do stuff legally, you know, but people who are going to harvest illegally out of places are going to do it regardless of your regulations. So, um, I, you know, it's money, money, money talks. So if they can get money for it and go out and do it, they're just going to go out and do it. And so, you know, I will say the last couple of years, because the seasons have not been good here in the Northwest because of those heat events, um, we've seen less of it. <laughs> so there's that. Um, because it's not, it's not, people can't find stuff because if you don't have a dog right now, it's really hard. Um, because they're just, they're super deep. So silver lining, I guess. Yeah. It sounds like it's a big um, juicy topic, but, um, yeah, it's a big topic. I mean, I could talk for an hour on that probably, um, <laughs> terms of tips and advice. Um, you know, if you're just getting started, one of the things that I would say is, um, you know, one be, <clears throat> I was just saying this to a group of students we had the other day who were kind of at our like intermediate level. And I was like, you know, be, um, you know, work on patience and resilience and then be proud of yourself for the little steps along the way, right? Like a lot of us, like when we teach dogs to do this, you know, you start, um, our training program generally takes a few months, right? To get to where we get to the field and then actually finding stuff takes longer usually, but, um, you know, be proud of all those little steps along the way, like take the small wins, be excited about that, right? Like when you first start out, you, unless you're a dog trainer, you really don't know how to like interact with your dog and get them to, to find things. And so from week one to week, you know, 12, I tell people like, give yourself a round of applause. Look at how far you've come. You've taught your dog to find a thing. It's really actually pretty hard to do, right? And you've done it in a really quick period of time. So you know, be generous to yourself. Um, you know, if I would say this, this is actually a tip that I would recommend to everybody is if um, if you're not feeling it that day, if you're not feeling well, if you're stressed out, if, you, if your dog is not feeling well, don't force the situation. You, this is supposed to be a fun game. Don't, um, don't do it because you think you need to do it. You don't need to do it every day. Um, it's supposed to be a fun game for you and your, you know, fluffy canine partner to, to do together. So don't... Um, don't stress yourself out over it if you're not meeting particular goals. Um, work with the dog where they're at. Um, you can always go back a couple of steps. Don't don't try to push yourself too fast. Would be my recommendation. Um, I'm trying to think, what other pieces of advice have people given? I've got, I mean, I got a million probably, but um, go slowly. Build good foundations. Um, I know it's frustrating for folks. Like, cause you want to get out there and do stuff, but it pays off a lot later. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, um, I, you know, expectation setting. That's the other thing I do a lot when we take people out in the field, as I said, expectations, I'm like, Hey, we're out here to have a good time. Don't expect you're going to find something your first time out. Right. A lot of this is just getting used to the environment. Um, you know, if you can walk away from every lesson that we do with like one nugget of something that you learned that day, that's great. Um, you know, we throw a lot of information at folks. So it's just, you know, take take little tidbits and do what you can. Love that. Um, and then I think maybe just we we'll maybe wrap up on this little question, but your favorite truffle memory or experience, and that may or may not be a truffle dish or a, a hunt or a find or maybe a combination of all these things. Is there anything that comes to mind that um, gave you a, a really pinch me or wow moment or something like that? Oh, there's probably a lot. Um, my my head is just like spinning with answers. Um, you know, I would say more than one particular memory. One thing that happens a lot when we hunt is just just that that feeling of just like happiness and calmness. So, oftentimes, I mean, I'm I'm getting one flashback of a memory of me and some of our teammates were out um, out hunting and in the springtime we like to do that with the champagne in hand and just letting the dogs run around it's very like not purposeful we must find a lot of truffles but just like having fun right and those are the days truffles like and champagne it can... sounds like you've got it nailed there <laughs> right exactly so we do that a lot like so often after classes and stuff if it's me and one of the other instructors or their teammates we're, we're up at these locations we'll just we'll have you know um if we do outing sometimes we have champagne with us but like cider or something whatever and we'll just take the dogs on a walk and yes occasionally dogs will find stuff but our goal is not 
finding truffles at that moment. It's just kind of enjoying the atmosphere with everybody. So those are some of my favorite memories. Um, I, I can't remember the first, I hate to say this, but I can't remember the first time one of my dogs found a truffle. So I don't, it can't be like, that was the best moment. Cause I just, it's all blurred together. Um, I did have one really lovely experience this year that made me so happy that was on a truffle orchard. It's been a really hard year. Um, Lolo, whatever, long story short, I took her out to one of these truffle orchards that had a lot of truffles in it. And within 10 minutes, you could just see the joy on her face. Like she was just finding a ton of them. And we only literally had 10 minutes to like hunt before I had to leave town. But like, it just, it made us both so happy. And I could like feel that coming from her. And I'm trying to not anthropomorphize, but like, you could just see how pumped she was to get a chance to do this. And so being able to see your dogs be happy and really enjoy what they were either bred to do or you train them to do is really fun. And so I, that's my favorite part is watching the dogs really like enjoy themselves while they're doing it. Amazing. And your favorite, or it doesn't have to be the favorite, um, truffle dish and maybe truffle species as well. Yeah. Well, so my current favorite, which is easy, is going to, okay, two things. Um, the easy one first, which is our native black truffles. Um, I honestly, this is very low budget and super easy. Um, they infuse really well into coconut because it has a lot of fat. So I buy those little, you can make them, but again, not my skill set, those little like coconut macaroons. I'll put black truffles in there with those coconut macaroons and just shove them in the fridge for a few days. It, it, it makes like a lovely combo. Um, mm. And then I have lots of little, you know, delicious dessert snacks. Um, so that's a favorite. Um, one of my other favorites to do is again, very simple, very easy, Paragord truffle. Um, you can make this very pretty if you want, but um, at toast with butter, you can infuse the butter if you want. Um, uh, microplaned truffle probably, um, paragord, and then a little bit of honey and salt. Um, and it's like all that like salt fat coming together with the truffle is really, 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 really good. And that's honestly one of my favorites. Um, the other favorite is avocado and with either native black or the paragord, you infuse it into it and put that on toast. Again, I'm a millennial, so like avocado toast tracks. So <laughs> I'll lean into it, but it's really good. So that would be some of my favorites, yeah. Amazing, they all sound uh, delicious. Um, well, I mean, that. That's pretty much uh, brings us to the end, I think. And I just wanted to say, um, yeah. it's been amazing speaking to you. And um, yeah, I'd love to stay connected. And uh, is is there yeah for anyone that wants to come check out more of your stuff? And I know you've obviously got a bunch of training and courses and things like that. But look, where where should people check you out? Follow you? Do you want to just men mention that? Maybe? Yeah, yeah. The easiest thing right now is you can either just if you Google Truffle Dog Company, will pop up. We primarily redoing the website so thank you for your patience everybody if you look at it um so it'll be better soon um but honestly we're most active on on either facebook we have a bunch of training forums on there which everybody is welcome to join it's a great place to just like chat people from all over the world um uh and then we have um, and then instagram is honestly um it's just facebook and instagram are generally where you'll find us or, or online on the website are the best places but reach out to us Again, we're here to kind of build global community around this. So like this has been delightful to chat and excited to do it more. Um, but we're here to be a resource to kind of help people through this process. So as much as we can, we kind of want to demystify as much as possible. So, yeah. Amazing. Well, um, mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks for being such an awesome guest. I know this yeah. is going to go down really, really well with anyone and everyone who listens to it. So, um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, no, it's been super fun. Thank you. Um, and if you are ever out in my neck of the woods, you need to for sure let me know. Obviously love to take you out and just so you can see, cause it's different. It's just very different here than in, in Europe. So um, it'd be super fun to take you out and get to see it. Awesome, I would love that. Thank you.